This is Thomas. He is one of 27,000 babies born premature in Australia each year. Thomas was born at 24 weeks gestation. Of a full term 40 week pregnancy or nine months, that's four months too early and four months that he will spend in a neonatal intensive care nursery, separated from his parents for extended periods at a time when his brain is undergoing some of its most complex and rapid growth. The environment that best supports this rapid brain growth is of course the mother's womb, characterised by darkness, sounds that are muffled and of low frequency, smooth movement and consistent touch. In grave contrast, Thomas and other babies born premature will experience bright lights, sounds that are sharp and of high frequency, quick abrupt movements and touch that is unpredictable and often painful. From 26 weeks to 40 weeks when Thomas was supposed to be born, his brain will increase in size by 400%. We can see here at 26 weeks a very smooth and immature brain evident by the few folds in its surface. Whereas at 40 weeks, we see a much more detailed brain scan with significant folding of the surface of the brain. Every touch, sound, smell, interaction that Thomas has with his outside world over the course of his time in the neonatal nursery is integrated into the wiring of his developing brain, setting the foundation for his future development. Thomas and other babies born premature are at significantly greater risk of developmental difficulties later on. 50% of very preterm infants, that's those born before 32 weeks, will experience a motor, cognitive or behavioural impairment in early childhood. The premature birth of a baby is an incredibly sensitive time for all those involved. And I met Sally, Thomas's mother, when Thomas was just two weeks old. Like so many parents who have a baby in the neonatal nursery, Sally was scared and highly anxious. She was overwhelmed, and amongst the staff and technical equipment that was keeping Thomas alive, she had no idea what her role was. Sally is not alone. Parents of premature infants have up to 10 times the rate of anxiety and depression compared with parents of term infants. The symptoms of psychological distress will often pers persist beyond taking their babies home from the hospital, with approximately 25% of mothers reporting significant symptoms two years after the birth. This is double the rate of parents of term infants. Addressing this impact of premature birth on parent wellbeing is absolutely vital, as parent mental health problems are also associated with poorer child developmental outcomes in premature infants. I'm Dr Abby Eels. I'm a neonatal occupational therapist and researcher, and I've been apprenticing this problem and working with babies like Thomas and their parents for the past 11 years. I have seen firsthand the impact that premature birth can have on child development, and I have sat with hundreds of mothers and fathers as they, as they have feared for their baby's life, grieved the loss of their pregnancy, and struggled to parent in the neonatal nursery. The premature infant's vulnerable systems, the psychological distress experienced by their parents, contributes to this challenge of a compromised parent-infant attachment relationship. That is the connection that is formed between a parent and their baby. This attachment relationship is integral to a child's healthy development and their parents' well-being. When we explore the problem landscape, there seems to be many, many reasons as to why this challenge is persisting. And today I'm going to talk through two of those with you. Most importantly, at the macro level, no nationally agreed clinical practice guidelines appears to be the source of significant inefficiency, waste and duplication. The National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia has a responsibility to reinforce the need for better coordination to ensure Australian clinicians and consumers have access to current, high quality and relevant guidelines in areas of identified need. Now, unfortunately, there has not been any nationally endorsed guidelines around the care of the premature uh, infant and their families since they were withdrawn 13 years ago. 
At the micro level, what appears to be exacerbating this challenge is staff, beliefs, attitudes and the training that they're receiving. The neonatal nurse is one of the biggest predictors of a parent being able to establish a connection with their infant. Now, unfortunately, not all staff are open to a change in model of care from what historically was a very paternalistic approach towards parents in the nursery to now regarding them as equal partners in the care. Moving on to the solution landscape, there are seven elements within this landscape and I'd like to explore four of those with you in more detail. Due to the plasticity of the developing brain and its responsiveness to the environment, preventative early intervention programs has the greatest potential to permanently alter a child's developmental trajectory. A systematic review looking at early intervention programs designed specifically for premature infants showed that it was those programs that fostered and supported the parent-infant attachment relationship rather than child development or parent support alone that had the greatest impact on a child's cognitive outcomes. Acknowledging the importance of the parental role in neonatal care, we're seeing a universal shift to models of care around the world that are more family-centred and family integrated, where parents are actively encouraged to participate in the care of their baby. And skin to skin kangaroo care. This is an intervention where parents will hold their premature babies against their bare chest and it's backed by over 20 years of scientific evidence showing improved health outcomes for both the infant and the parent. This is one of the few interventions that is solely reserved for parents in the neonatal nursery. When we explore the gaps between the problem landscape and the solution landscape, there are multiple. And today we're going to have a look at one of these. We found that there was inconsistent developmental follow-up of high-risk premature infants. Eligibility criteria for this developmental follow-up is often based on gestational age or birth weight cutoffs, and it's determined by individual hospitals based on their available staffing and resources. So if you have a baby who was born less than 32 weeks at one hospital, you'll receive close developmental monitoring follow-up. At another hospital, you don't receive this follow-up unless your baby is born at less than 28 weeks. This creates inconsistent support for parents post-discharge and greater exposure to neurodevelopmental delays as that window to tap into that early neuroplasticity is missed. When we consider the problem landscape, the solution landscape and the gaps within these, we identified five key levers for change to work towards strengthening the parent-infant attachment relationship. Guideline funding and research translation can go a very long way to improving the health outcomes of premature babies and their families, thus reducing the financial costs um, associated with premature birth. Wider implementation of programs that are fostering that parent-infant attachment relationship, that are focusing on collaborating and partnering with parents in care is needed. Improved research collaboration in particular of preventative early intervention programs. Addressing staff attitudes and beliefs is absolutely vital to success. And with this, providing them with increased support and education to do that relationship-based piece that we're asking them to do. I work across three different neonatal intensive care nurseries in the one city, and I see inconsistent practices across these three hospitals. I've been at the coalface of this challenge for over a decade, and I really thought I knew the problem and the root causes uh, of this challenge of a compromised parent-infant attachment relationship. I didn't. <laughs> This issue uh, has the elements and characteristics of a complex adaptive system. And whilst I could uh, appreciate and accept that different health organisations and not-for-profits would deliver care in divergent yet still altruistic ways, I hadn't realised that these ambitions did not always mean successful execution. And whilst they might be well-intentioned, at times they can be counterproductive. What became very clear is that effective overarching policy and education can influence the entire system. We need clear, relevant and realistic guidelines to be continually improving the development of the parent-infant attachment relationship. 
And this is why I started Luna Baby, to support, educate and empower parents like Sally to care for their babies like Thomas in ways that are fostering and nurturing that parent-infant attachment relationship and to support and educate hospitals and their staff in delivering consistent, evidence-based care that can improve the outcomes for premature infants and their families. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your work and for an incredible uh, presentation. It's very powerful. Uh, I wonder if, for the benefit of the audience, maybe you can share a bit about Luna Baby because we had the benefits of reading your documentation, but it uh, would be great for everyone else yeah, to get a, a taste. Yeah, we definitely answer that one. Um, so we are working on a few different products at the moment for Luna Baby, but um, one of them is a partnership with the International Kangaroo Foundation uh, in Colombia where uh, skin to Skin Kangaroo Care uh, was founded back in the 80s. Um, due to a lack of incubators, multiple babies were put into one incubator, infection was rife and the mortality rate was rising. So they then started using the mothers as the incubators, holding the baby skin to skin. Um, they've been using uh, a, a, a kangaroo care band um, at the International Kangaroo Foundation and hospitals around Colombia um, for over 20 years and uh, they've published many, many papers on the positive outcomes and recently published the 20-year um, outcomes showing benefits to both um, baby and parent. So Luna Baby is, is bringing this product to Australia to start with. Um, it's very simple, uh, but what we're wanting is hospitals um, and institutions to get on board and work towards gifting every parent that is admitted with a low birth weight or, or premature baby into a neonatal nursery is gifted a kangaroo care ban. They're receiving consistent education and we're delivering a consistent message about how powerful parents are, how important their role is in the neonatal nursery. So that's one of the products, but there's a few more that will be coming out. All of them are really specifically designed to support that parent-infant attachment um, relationship. Really important work and really wonderful presentation. Thank, um, you. thank you so much. Um, so I, um, you mentioned that like uh, two of the main problems that you see is um, lack of a, a clinical practice guidelines and then also the staff attitudes and training. So I'm curious if you had looked at um, successful cases uh, of bottom up ways where you could change staff attitudes mm -hmm. uh, or uh, bring about policy or guideline changes. Yeah. Um, I might speak to the staff attitudes. Um, there is some work, uh, there is a program called FI Care or Family Integrated Care, um, and something that really sets this program apart from other programs is that they really acknowledge um, that the neonatal nurse's role has expanded greatly over time, and they have what we now refer to as an attacher role. Um, so in this particular program, not only are they providing education to the parent, but the nurses get weekly supervision and support with um, social worker psychologists, because they're, they, they are identifying and, and acknowledging that we are asking you to change the way that you've worked for you know, centuries, um, we, are we are asking you to change it greatly and we actually haven't, our, our training hasn't provided you necessarily with the skills to do that. So um, I think that particularly uh, providing more education within the university and the training um, institutions around developmental, family-centred, family-integrated care is absolutely a good start. Um, and uh, one of the heads of nursing at the University of Melbourne I have spoken with um, and are working towards providing some lectures um, to the students in that space. Did you want to speak to... With the second issue you talked about with how to influence the policy and the guidelines at the Commonwealth level, that might require a less than orthodox or unconventional campaign to garner some action. Um, the activity that we conducted on Friday was a great way for us to take what we want to do when we get back, and that is potentially looking at our media campaign, looking at also, we've noted, the not-for-profits, while well-intentioned, aren't necessarily coordinated, and potentially there's an opportunity to harness all of that enthusiasm and actually drive that 
towards influencing policyholders. And then it's going to the federal and state health ministers and actually educating them about this problem. Because for a clinical guideline to be withdrawn 13 years ago and not to be reissued, and we have from interviews understood that um, the issue is deeply embarrassing and needs some action taken, we may have to highlight through some other ways. Great, I think that's it from us. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, we wish you uh, all the best for Luna Baby and, and, and your endeavors, uh, particularly with re uh, regards to the guidelines. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.